following Ambassador Oren. But you remember that, as a historian, I'm sure you know this story, that when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, he said, oh, you're the little lady who started this big war. <laughs> so you're the big man who started this little war um, over your book. And the first thing I wanted to ask you was whether you're surprised at the furor and the controversy and the polemics that have surrounded your book. And if you're not familiar with them, I brought several choice clippings um, <laughs> so that you could There's look over them. There's a box behind here. <laughs> exactly. There's a box. There. Did it surprise you? Uh, first of all, shalom. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you for that reception. You don't know I've... Um, but again, I get very sentimental, so I, I warn you, a cry warning. Um, this is the last event of a two and a half week cross the nation uh, tour. Um, I, I'm, I'm very impressed that you can actually give me a standing ovation because I could give you an ovation, but I'm not sure I could stand at this point. Um, so thank you. I, I would respond, uh, David, by um, quoting another Lincoln story. Lincoln used to tell the story of going into a small Illinois town and seeing a man who had been tarred and feathered and ridden out of town on a rail. That's what they used to do. And Lincoln is watching this horrible uh, exhibition, and he notices that the man is smiling. And Lincoln tells the story. He goes up to the man. He says, wait a minute. You're being tarred and feathered. You're being ridden out of town on a rail. Why are you smiling? And the man says, well, if it weren't for the honor of it all, I'd rather walk. <laughs> so I've had a little tarring. Uh, a little feathering, but most of it has, in fact, been very superficial. Most of the tarring and feathering has not been about the book, but a bit about me. It's been uh, rather personal, and I'm not going to go into the whole little litany of things I've been called in the last two and three weeks. Um, and but they're they're pretty choice and pretty juicy. But the honor of it was that almost nobody was taking this book on in its merits. No one was challenging the content of the work. So, so bring it on. Call me whatever you want to call me. But read the book. And let's have the discussion that the book was designed to initiate, to inaugurate. And um, I, this book was supposed to come out in uh, October. October, November is the time when publishers bring out their serious works of nonfiction. All right? This is the month where you do beach reading. You know this? Those of us of a certain, certain age remember Jaws. That was like the ultimate summer reading book. You wouldn't go in the water. I pressured Random House, my poor publishers, to bring this book out now in late June, precisely because we are at a fateful juncture in the negotiations for a possible, what we would call a very bad deal uh, on the Iranian nuclear program. So it came out now on purpose. I told Random House, you know, I know it's beach reading. We'll call the book Jews, all right? <laughs> People will be afraid to go in the water. It'll be like a, a yarmulke going through. But, um, but can I say this in the Nixon Library? Um, that's what it was designed to do. It was designed to have, have precisely this reaction. So I was gratified. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to actually discuss the substantive part of the book Thank in you. just a moment, um, not right away. The first thing, the first, I want to ask you one personal question, which is there is, and you talk about this a little bit in the book, there is a great contrast between being a historian and being an ambassador. For that matter, being a citizen and being an ambassador, and being an ambassador entails all sorts of restraint and care, and there are things you can't say. Now, I've never been a diplomat, <clears throat> although I've been a clergy, so it requires a certain amount. Always speak certain your mind. Amount, right, exactly. A certain amount of diplomacy, especially right. with the parents of children in our school. Right. But <laughs> no, your child's wonderful, really wonderful. <laughs> um, but I wonder when you when you wrote the book, how how did you approach it? I mean, did you internally say, okay, I'm no longer a diplomat. I'm a historian, or I'm a loyal citizen of Israel. I mean, what was your self-conception as you sat down to write it? It was actually, a, it, at times, an agonizing process. First of all, to decide to write the book. Um, I had to go through a process of sort of detoxing from being an ambassador. When I first came back to Israel, this is in the beginning of 2014, and I went on television, I had no idea who I was. Am I still ambassador? Can I say things? Can I say something critical of the administration? Can I say something critical of the prime minister of Israel? 
Um, and actually, there was, there was an Israeli anchor woman, Ayala Hassan, who was terrific. And we went for a commercial break. She turned to me and slapped me in the face. And she said, stop it. Stop being an ambassador. Get out of that character. And every time I see her now, I go over and give her back. Because of you, you she got me out of it. It was a terrific moment. The book was harder still, because not only was I making a transition from being a, an historian ambassador to a private citizen writing a memoir, I had never before written in the first person. I'd never written a sentence that began with I. It was always about, you know, Richard Nixon did this. Golda Meir did this. Um, and that was a transition. What's my voice? Who am I in the book? And then you come up against the really hard question. What do you write about and what do you don't? As an historian, I always say the historian's job is the job of decision maker. For every hundred facts, one goes in a book. Ninety-nine goes, you get leave out. So you have to make a decision all the time. In this, the decisions are what is, it, is discreet to, dis, to disclose? Are you betraying a confidence? Are you hurting anybody you don't want to hurt? I'm very sensitive to this. And then what are my duties as someone who was privy to classified information? Now, you sometimes sign agreements that say you, you cannot disclose things, but very often it's left to discretion. Mm -hmm. I had a good sense of the red lines. This book was vetted by seven Israeli agencies, twice by the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, twice by the Defense Ministry, the Justice Ministry, the Foreign Ministry, and the Mossad. The book is about five pages long. <laughs> These are just, just, just photographs here. There's, no, there's nothing really in it. Um, this was, by the way, an extraordinary process. Um, I'd never gone through it before. I actually thank the vetters in the acknowledgments. I don't know if it was ever done because I was so impressed with the way they worked and the arguments. And you could actually get into an argument with them. They'd say, you can't have this. Say, this is why you need this. And sometimes I won, sometimes I didn't win. They actually took out very little. So the whole process of deciding how to write this book in itself could be something of a book, David. The difference between Israeli society and American society, which is probably very hard to capture in a sentence, seems to me couldn't be captured better than by our imagining George Stephanopoulos slapping the ambassador of the United States <laughs> um, on a Sunday morning talk show when they go to commercial. But doesn't that say something, actually, that story about the intimacy of Israeli society that is very different from the way America works? So I go back to your first question. I set myself among the outline. I set myself an outline. Okay, who am I going to be? Am I going to be uh, too prescient, too self-aggrandizing, um, by, by contrast, too self-deprecating? You had to get it just right. But I, one of the items I listed was called nuggets. What were the nuggets? I wanted to um, expound on the differences between American society and Israeli society, and particularly between Israeli political culture and American political culture. For example, America is a Roman-style uh, republic. Israel is an Athenian-style democracy, which means we all yell at each other and scream at each other and throw chairs. Um, lots of civility. You know, my distinguished colleague from across the aisle. We don't have that in Israel. It's like knucklehead. You know, bimbo. Um, <laughs> very different. Um, I learned my father was a, a career officer in the U.S. military. I, mean, I, I talk about him a lot. Uh, he, he, he landed on Normandy, fall fought through World War II. He's, he's 90 years old. I'm, I'm seeing him for the July 4th tomorrow. Um, but he taught me as a kid that Americans salute the rank and not the person. That's very important to internalize. Uh, I looked at some of the reactions of conservative, even Fox commentators, to the decision of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to speak before the, both houses of Congress in March. They supported the Prime Minister. They weren't big fans of the President, but you don't disrespect the office of the presidency. Israel, we don't salute anybody. You know, in the United States, the former President is still Mr. President. In Israel, the former President is, is Ehud. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Uh, we don't have that. And there was one observation which uh, I, I flag quite often is that Americans are nice until they're not. <laughs> and it can happen very quickly and that always throws Israelis off because they don't quite know where they are, whether Americans are in their nice mood or not, not nice mood. And I, 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 I sort of boil it down to the photographs of President Obama and Vice President Biden if you go into any embassy, probably any post office, you have a picture of the president, the vice president, and look at their, look at their expressions. They are smiling. They've got big 
teeth, smiling. Look at the picture in an Israeli post office. Of, right, you got it. You got the president at the time of Shimon Peres, the, the prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. They are looking at the camera and scowling. <laughs> scowling. And you think about, okay, what are the difference? And I, I consider that, that American leaders can afford to smile. <laughs> and we live in a very, very tough neighborhood that if you even show a bit of that a little twinkling in your eye, it could prove to be dangerous and your enemies could, could derive the wrong conclusions. So you juxtapose these pictures of the president and the prime minister, the president and the vice president, and you see it all, you see the nugget. Also, we're the world's leader in dental care. I don't know if that... <laughs> that um, <too. laughs> Americans have but very white teeth. You did, you did, you did make, a, though, an observation that sort of complicates this about the use of profanity. I wonder if you would share that with the... I, yeah, well, how is it? We're in the White House mock-up here. Um, there's, there's, there's some spicy language in this book, and that was a decision also, I had to say, not to use asterisks and things like this, but to actually use the language because um, uh, Washington political culture is heavy on expletives, just is. And um, every other word, basically, is a four-letter word. And, and everybody uses it. And I, I don't know what it is. It's, it's like a default word, or it's made to sound tough. But that's the way people talk. Um, my, how can I, can I say this in front of you guys? I mean, I don't know. Yeah? yeah? So I quote my first conversation with Rahm Emanuel, which was at, typically at 2 o'clock in the morning. And um, I'm causing up, and I grab the for the phone and get Rahm in my ear. And Rahm B opens up with... I don't like this fucking shit. <laughs> and I say, Rom, I don't like this fucking shit either. <laughs> what are you supposed to make of that? Now, the interesting thing is that Israelis don't curse. We have some curse words that are almost all Arabic and Russian. We don't know what they are. They're used, in, they're used wrongly. We really don't even know what they mean. <laughs> because here's the Bible. God does not curse. God condemns, but he doesn't use curse words. And so Hebrew doesn't bequeath us that vocabulary. We don't have it. We couldn't, I couldn't translate. So I, when, the, when the White House used a certain epithet to describe Netanyahu chicken shit, um, last, what was it, last spring, uh, um, I had to go on Israeli television for 12 hours and try to find the, is the Hebrew equivalent of chicken shit. Because... <laughs> Israelis aren't going to get this chicken. I don't get it. What does it mean? And and you can say pachdan, but it's not pachdan. It's not pachdan is a coward. But it's something you're missing something. So we just don't have it. And it was it was a nugget. It was a nugget. The way Americans speak in American political culture and the way the Israelis speak. So I, okay. So let's move to the substan substantive. This is substantive uh, issues, right? <laughs> language. Language is culture. Yeah. That's right. Um, Iran. You chose the, the release of the book because obviously this is a crucial time and uh, I was just talking about the fact that we had a meeting yesterday and I don't think it's any, it's not a secret because he's been public about it with Congressman Ted Lieu who said that he is inclined to oppose any agreement that doesn't meet all the conditions basically that Israel has asked for and it doesn't look like this one will so even the Democrats, yes you may applaud, that's okay with me. Um, I'm not going to object to any. Uh, but I think we're, we're in for a huge fight in America, it looks that way, um, and, and I wonder what your take is on, because so much of the book is a characterization of the different ways that, that the administration sees Israel and that the Israeli administration sees Israel's predicament. So can you just talk about Iran and what you expect and, and what you fear? Oh, thank you, David. I just um, I've actually spent several time meetings uh, in the last two days here with uh, with your congressman, with Ed Royce, who does uh, just an astounding job. A great friend. Thank you. Um, I I had the uh, the privilege. I stress the privilege of um, representing Israel with a team in nearly five years of intimate discussions with the United States, with the, with the administration on the Iranian nuclear program. And this were experts, it was scientists, security people, all classified. Here's what I can tell you: We looked at the same data, and we derived pretty much the same conclusions. Where Iran was in its program, number of centrifuges, number of facilities, how long it would take them to break out if they decided to break out and to create nuclear weapons. We understood that. Where were the gaps? The biggest gap, and this is going to sound 
it's going to sound silly. The biggest gap is a structural gap. The United States, you may notice, is a big country. You are far away from the Middle East. You are not threatened with national annihilation by the Iranians. And the United States has the largest military capabilities of any country on Earth. Israel is a small country. We are located in Iran's backyard. Uh, we are threatened with genocide by the Iranian regime. They said they're going to wipe us off the map. We've got to take it seriously. And the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, is a very formidable army. We're roughly twice as big as the French and British army combined. But I don't want to just shock anybody. We do not have aircraft carriers. We do not have strategic bombers. Which means that our margin for error on Iran is exactly zero. Exactly zero. We, cannot make, we can't even make a, 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 a fraction of a mistake. So let's start with that. Then in addition to the structural differences, there were the ideological and conceptual differences. And I can boil it down this way. And, I, and with the, as, as a researcher, as, as a writer, uh, I'm very, it's very easy to write about the President of the United States because he's very vocal and he, he, he expresses his mind. So he has said that the Iranian regime is rational. He, ha he says it many times. He says they're anti-Semitic, but they're rational. This is a recent uh, interview with our, with our common friend Jeff Goldberg. They're rational. They operate, uh, the regime operates on a cost-benefit analysis. If properly engaged, it can be a, um, a uh, productive regional power. It can actually work for, to reconcile Sunni and Shiite uh, Muslims. I'm just quoting, folks. And this went to the heart of the debate in this intimate dialogue. And that, uh, and that, that if sanction relief if the sanctions were lifted, the Iranian regime would use this money for productive purposes. The Israeli position was no, that this is an, ir an irrational regime, and that irrational regimes, like the Nazis, can some take, sometimes take rational steps to reach insane goals, conquering Poland and Czechoslovakia, rational goal, that sometimes you have a regime like the Nazis, that even on the last day of the war, while Germany is being conquered, they're taking precious military resources and using it to kill Jews. That's an irrational regime. That this is an irrational regime that was a, a jihadist um, government, which is the world's largest sponsor of terror. It is conducting or trying to conduct terror across five continents, now 35 cities, trying to kill Jews, Israelis, and Americans, by the way, trying to blow up my embassy in downtown Washington, D.C., trying to blow up a, a big Cafe Milano, uh, in Washington, D.C. and assassinate the Saudi ambassador, but kill everybody else in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the restaurant as well. This is not a sane regime. And this is not a regime that's going to take $100 billion in sanction relief and use it to build roads. It's going to take $100 billion in sanction relief and use it to upgrade Hezbollah and other terrorist groups that are going to try to kill us. So it came down to that type of distinction. So there, you, I just basically said the whole debate in something over two minutes. Um, but that's it. Well, I, I, I would, I'm not adding because I'm sure given more time you would say exactly this, but I, I, I write a weekly column for Time, and on this I talked about the fact that every, the, the, the vast majority of Iranians are not actually all that enamored of their regime, and every regime that wants to exercise any kind of effective tyranny, they know they have to keep the military fat and happy. So the first block of money is going to go to the Revolutionary Guards and then to all the proxies and only then after that to whatever infrastructure needs to keep them in power but there has never been over the past 30 years there's never been any backing off from their declared intent to, to be yes to wipe you off the map so it's not as though there's it's not as though this is a new agenda it's a very old agenda Indeed. and you know they, they had a dry run on the Arab Spring in June 2009, right. they had the Green Revolution, and they learned, they're very smart, this, never underestimate the intelligence of Iranians, ayatollahs. They, Edward Barak, the defense minister, used to say they don't play checkers, they play chess, and they don't play one-tiered chess, they play triple-tiered chess. So they had a dry run, and they learned how to cope with a popular revolution. And they created basically a million-man army with uh, a thug corps known as the Besiege, and today, if you go on a, in, in Iran, even if you don't like the regime, you go on a little website that says something critical of the supreme leaders, there's going to be a knock on your door in about two minutes. And you're going to disappear <laughs> for a very long time. You may never come back again. They have this down. What and you, that, you have not seen a 
peep of a popular opposition since June 2009. They what, got it down. What's your prediction about what's going to happen and, and, will con and the reaction in Congress? I, I feel like I should have a, a pool about this. I, I, I don't want to sound, again, though I spent most of my life in, in Jerusalem, I don't want to sound too prophetic. And it, it, it's, it's like this. If I, I tr always try to put myself in the other guy's seat. And the other guy, in this case, is an Iranian negotiator. Now, since 2009, the position of the administration has been that the window for diplomacy will not remain open indefinitely. But guess what? It's not a window. It's an aperture. It never closes. And the Iranians have been led to learn that the longer they negotiate, the more concessions they're going to get. So I ask myself now, at this juncture, what is Iran's interest in signing this agreement, say, as early as Sunday? Uh, I was pretty sure they weren't going to sign on June 30th, and again, I sound prophetic, but it's not. It's just, it's just re seeing the world through their eyes. They have already gained immensely just from the negotiations. Remember when the negotiations started six years ago, the United States said Iran has no right to enrich, Iran has no right to have nuclear facilities, no right to have centrifuges, Iran is a terror-sponsoring state. Where, where, what is the American position today? Iran has a right to enrich. Iran gets to keep its facilities. Some of them may be, tra may be transformed in some ways, but they get to keep, nothing is being dismantled. They get to keep all their centrifuges. Nothing is being dismantled. And Iran has moved from being part of the problem to being part of the solution. And there's a tremendous amount of legitimacy it's gained for achieving its hegemonical uh, uh, aspirations in the Middle East which is to be the, the, the Middle East primary power. So you haven't heard for a long time uh, anybody in Washington say, Assad must go. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. It's not here anymore. Um, not much criticism of Iranian involvement in Iraq, Iranian involvement in Yemen. Think about it. So they've already gained immensely by not signing. So I have to ask myself, as an Iranian negotiator, what am I going to get if I sign next week? What I'd get would be sanction relief. That, that's the concrete goal here. But then I have to ask myself, wait a minute, if I hold out a little longer, maybe the sanctions will unravel anyway. And maybe I won't have to give up anything. And um, so I'm uncertain whether this week the Iranians will sign. Maybe they'll give some kind of broad framework agreement, not an actual hard and fast treaty. Uh, the president said, I guess two days ago, that he's ready to walk away from the table. I'm sorry, if that's true, that is a very important position. I'm not going to, if that's true, he has to stick by that. Now that he said that, he has to be able to walk away. I, last point, I'm, I'm drawing on. I, I wrote a, um, you hear all this criticism I get um, for being politically incorrect in this book, but a, a couple of, I guess two months ago, I wrote a, a Time piece, right. Time magazine piece uh, called How Not to Buy a Middle Eastern Carpet. And I was called a, an Orientalist, I was called a cultural stereotyper. Notice I didn't say Persian carpet, I said Middle Eastern right. carpet. And I drew on my own experience as someone who has gone carpet shopping quite often around the area. The first law of carpet shop buying is you never answer the carpet merchant's question, how much are you interested in spending? Because right. then that becomes the base. So uh, if, 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 uh, if the Iranians are saying to the United States, say in 2010, um, how many centrifuges do you think we should have? All right, and America says, oh, I don't know, 200. That gets up to 6,000 real quick. Yep. Second thing you never do is you always have to be able to walk away. Always have to walk away. If the, if the carpet merchant comes after you, you've got a deal. If he doesn't come after you, you don't got a deal. In the Iranian nuclear arrangements, the Iranians walked away and everyone went running after them. They went, the customers went running after the merchants saying, please, I want to buy your carpet. And that's been the case up to now. And so if the president now is saying, I'm, a, I'm the carpet buyer, I'm going to walk away, and he means it, that'll be an important message. I want to know structurally, do you think the fact that the leadership of Iran sees itself basically as leaders in perpetuity, whereas American leadership changes every four to eight years, means also that American leadership just structurally is always more anxious to get a deal because that's your legacy. It's legacy. Whereas if you know you're going to be there in 20 years, or at least you plan to be there in 20 years, you don't have to worry about whether you get it today. Um, indeed. And there's some of the people who maybe even think in terms of immortality there. Right. Um, and yes, and, and I, you know, I understand legacy. You know, the, um, the Republicans, uh, one that said it, 
in the last midterms. And, um, and I went on Israeli television. There were a number of Israelis who said, well, that's that. No more problems from Washington. Now the Republicans control both houses. And my report, my response was, not so fast. A president who is stymied on his domestic agenda at the end of his second term is going to be looking to build his legacy on foreign affairs issues. One was going to be Iran, the other is going to be Palestinian issues. And coming to a theater near you, he, near us in this case, uh, he'll, they'll be focusing for legacy issues. Okay, so I, mm. I, I, want, to, I want to take a brief pause for a commercial announcement. <laughs> um, I'm only going to be able to discuss two more issues before I open it up to everyone, but this is an incredibly rich book. Oh. And it discusses infinitely more than we will be able to talk about tonight. And among other things are many interesting portraits of people that you all know, that you see on television, that you see in politics. And one of the reasons to read this book, you should excuse me for the gossip value of it, um, in addition no to the analysis <laughs> of the kind that you're hearing tonight. So I just wanted to, to be able to say that before I return to two more questions, one about the president and one about the American Jewish community, which are both topics that I think a, a, ought, ought to be at least discussed. Do you think, for example, the fact that the president had what was characterized as a very good week domestically will make him less um, over anxious about his foreign policy legacy? Because now he's got same-sex marriage, Obamacare. He has a fairly solid record of domestic achievements by the views of the administration. That is a really interesting insight, David. I hadn't considered that because I'm actually thinking the opposite. There was a sim he had a similar good week <laughs> a long time ago, back in, I think it was in, in 2011. A good week where things went for him on the Hill. Um, uh, the, the administration also gave itself very high grades for handling the, the Arab Spring. And, um, and I, um, I, talk, I talk about how I, I cabled the prime minister and I said, um, the president is, is to, to use a colloquial expression, is feeling his oats. And I think that he'll come back now to the Palestinian issue um, with renewed vigor, which would be to the same argument, but flipping it on its head. Um, I, I think it's an interesting comment you just made. I'll have to think about it. I actually do think occasionally. But um, the, the, I think the natural reaction would be, my gut feeling would say, he's on, he's, he's, he's on a roll. Mm. And, um, and that he will use this momentum, and he did have an extraordinary week this week, um, he would use this momentum to get on to his, to, to ride it to a, um, to a next, for his legacy issue. And by the way, again, quoting the White House, the Iranian nuclear deal is the most significant foreign policy achievement which this administration hopes to achieve in its second term in office. So it's here with all this momentum behind it. More than the pivot to Asia? <laughs> More than the pivot um, to Asia. Alas. So the... The portrait of the president is obviously a, a major and a, and, and a debated topic in the book. Um, I wonder if you would characterize for us why you think the president sees Israel the way he does, and how, how he sees Israel, and why he sees Israel the way he does. Well, this was, this was the, the chief question that occupied me when I first came into office, again, going back to 2009. The, the ambassador's duty is to understand the customer in this case, the customer being the President of the United States, a man who was not very well known in 2009. He hadn't been in politics that long. He, he ran a brilliant campaign, but how well did people actually know him? And I had to get, just like I want to see the world through the eyes of an Iranian negotiator, I had to see the world through Barack Obama's eyes and how to get there. So I used my, I, I gave myself a, a self-taught course called Obama 101. And I used all my historian's uh, skills by going, sitting down, doing my homework, reading everything he had uh, said, interviewed, uh, statements, and anything related, related to the Middle East and, and Israel. But two of the most important, was really the most important source of all was his own memoir, was Dreams from My Father, which I read again and again in almost like Talmudic scrutiny, looking through it, because he wasn't thinking of running for president back then. It was kind of a window into his soul. And, um, and then combining that with everything I had learned over the years of teaching at various universities in the United States. And understanding that, that in this administration, by the way, which had, had a highest percentage of professors of any administration since Kennedy, 
It was the most centralized administration since Roosevelt, and more decisions were actually made in the Oval Office. You put this all together and you begin to piece together a worldview. And the worldview has several components which are very important for Israel. First of all, America is not the world's policeman anymore. You may have heard this occasionally. America is going to work in a collegial fashion with other powers, particularly with international institutions such as the UN, which are not always so friendly to the state of Israel. Now, Israel was much more comfortable with America being the world's policeman. Um, a recoiling from the use of military force. A reaction to the, to the Iraq and Afghanistan war was something really deeper. It harkened back to even the 60s on campus. Uh, the president had a very illuminating remark at a conference in 2010 in which he said, and I quote, um, whether we like it or not, America is the world's leading military superpower. Now, think about that line for a second. Would you imagine John Kennedy saying that, or, or Bill Clinton saying that, or Ronald Reagan saying that? We, whether we like it or not. In Israel, we wake up in the morning and say a little bracha, a little blessing, that the world's leading superpower happens to be the United States of America, because it wasn't always the case. So that, that is an important part of the worldview. Um, reach out to what Obama called the Muslim world, which in itself is a concept, it's a concept taken from Islam, which had challenges for Israel, but also opportunities. If the president is, is, is engaging with Muslims around the world and saying Israel is legitimate, that's great. But there was unprecedented support for the Palestinian cause, uh, a, a, a unprecedented opposition to Israel's settlement policies, and right from the outset, um, president recognized Iran's right to have peaceful nuclear energy, and he made it his case to reach out and reconcile with Iran. Now, these are all issues that impacted us at a very fundamental level, and I had to report it, I had to understand it and internalize, and I set as my goal never be to be surprised. Um, I got surprised one time in particular, September 2013, uh, over the Syrian red line on the chemical weapons, where I actually thought there would be some rockets, American Tomahawk rockets into Damascus, and, and it didn't happen. And that was a big threshold event for Israel, by the way. It was perceived completely different in Israel than the way it was perceived here. But that, that, that was, I don't know, they used to say this when I grew up, getting inside someone's head. Uh, and that was very important for me. So, how do I ask this neutrally? Um, don't. Go ahead. Don't. Rip. So why <laughs> is it, in your view, given that your portrait is of the president is unsympathetic to the way you think a president should treat Israel. I think that's the best way to put it. Um, I don't want to say it's unsympathetic to the president. I don't want to say that you think he doesn't like Israel, but it's unsympathetic to the way that you think he should act towards Israel. Why is it that most American Jews still support the president and voted for him twice? Well, let, let me just, it's very interesting. I don't know what you're you like your decision or you, or you like the question or you're just oh, the interested in the answer. Okay, good. If you're applauding I don't the, the question, we're good. I don't good. get the applause. Um, first well, of all, that, I, that I wanna, actually is not a plausible explanation because I know most American Jews, um, or a number of them, and one thing they're not is stupid. They may not agree with your reasoning. Certainly not. But believe me, they're very articulate in their ability to defend their own reasoning. You may think, they're ridiculously wrong, but that's different from being stupid. No. So I'm going to let him decide. I, I, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. For, I, I didn't even hear who said it. Um, first, I just want to correct one, one impression. Sure. I think when I say that, that the president doesn't treat Israel in the way that I think is befitting an American president, befitting an ally, there's a reason why I called it this, uh, and that, that theme recurs quite frequently. How should an ally treat another ally? It doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. It's the way we disagree. Uh, is really the litmus of an alliance. Um, that is not, he is not categorically, uniformly, monochromatically in the wrong. First of all, Israel makes mistakes, but also there were times when we needed the president and he was there for us. And I have that, I think, a moving passage about how we turned to him during the Carmel fire disaster when all of northern Israel was going up on flames and we had no more retardant to put out the fire and we had no more uh, extinguishing planes. And I was sent by the prime minister to speak in this room, by the way, I had to cross this room. Were you there that night, Hanukkah party? Uh, December two, which, which 2010. Hanukkah? No, I wasn't. No, I was outside. I was, I was coming into the Hanukkah party, which is always very strange for uh, Jews because the, 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 the White House is already decorated with Christmas decorations. So you have a lot of rabbis, a lot of Orthodox Jews 
nibbling latkes under the, under the mistletoe. <laughs> It's, 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 it's very surreal. Kissing one another. No <laughs> Kissing one another. <laughs> Nagia. Um, and I was outside the, outside the White House, and, and I get a call from uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, using a voice that you do not want to hear the prime minister use, panic, saying, this fire has just killed 26 people. It's heading toward Haifa. We have no means of stopping it. Go and meet the president. And I go in, meet the president, and he immediately says, turns to his aide, Reggie Love, and says, give Israel whatever it needs. And I spent the entire night in the NSC in the West Wing. Um, of the 11 extinguishing planes in America's arsenal, we got eight. Uh, the US military scrubbed down warehouses throughout Europe to get us the retardant we need. We got these hotshot uh, commandos who parachute behind fires, put them out. They left Idaho and made it to Israel the next day. I mean, this was the alliance. So we had deep policy disagreements, and many of these policy agreements were made publicly, and I think that was a mis huge mistake. I can go into detail about that. No surprises, no daylight, but that doesn't mean that, he's, you know, that he is um, unexceptionally problematic for Israel. I want to make that case. Why American Jews, 78% in 2008, 70% in 2012, voted for Barack Obama? So I, um, I tell a story here where uh, I grew up in New Jersey, and you're supposed to applaud at this point, thank you. Um, those, of you those of you from New Jersey, right? Right? I spend more time defending the state of New Jersey than defending the state of Israel. I want you to know that. Um, I once said that to Senator Menendez and he didn't laugh. Um, I'm the only person in my family to move to Israel, to make Aliyah. I just, I grew up and I thought it was, I, I was inestimably lucky to be living at a time in Jewish history when there was a sovereign, strong Jewish state and I would be damned if I was going to spend my life in New Jersey and miss it. So I went off to Israel, but my entire family, quite big, including many people in this area, um, stayed here. And every single man in my family, a very educated and smart family, voted Democratic in both elections. I don't know a single person who voted Republican. And it's not as if they don't care about Israel, they care passionately about Israel. Some of them even like me. They certainly like my wife and kids, and they love my grandkids. Um, and I asked them, and we had this before. The single answer, the most frequent answer I got was the composition of the Supreme Court. And you do find it as, as social issues, caring about the poor, caring about the indigent, caring about single family mothers, caring about immigrants. These are Jewish liberal issues. And that's what you're seeing in the vote. It's, even for, for people in my, my in 2008, parts of my, members of my family were sleeping in Obama pajamas. <laughs> but much of that romance has died off. What's left are the core values, are the core liberal Jewish values. And I think if he were to run again,